Hello, my name is Bob Rombaugh. I'm an elder at New Life in Christ Church. We're going to be going through Systematic Theology 2. We went through Systematic Theology 1 a few months back. We're going to pick back up, starting with free will today. But uh, first, let's look at the schedule. You see free will here starting in September. And we should be ending at the end of November with oath and vows as we work our way through the Westminster Confession of Faith. Pastor Skip Tyler will be alternating with me on these lessons. And I'm looking forward to uh, your participation and, and viewing. And if you have questions when you see me in church, just pull me aside and we can talk about them. I want to start off with this uh, quote. Marcy Sproul, and then we'll do a little review of systematic theology. Why? Why do, why do we even want to do systematic theology? Theology is kind of run into hard times lately. But uh, according to R.C. Sproul, the late R.C. Sproul, who wrote that everyone's a theologian, he said this, each person has a theology that's based on how they view God. Even the atheists have an understanding of the God whom they reject. You can read that in Romans 1. Since we're all theologians by nature, the question isn't whether we will be theologians, it's whether we will be good theologians or bad theologians. The word theology is derived from two Greek words, theos and logos. In a basic sense, theology is a proper, theology proper, there's theology general, theology proper. Theology proper is God's word about God. He's revealed something to us about himself. He's spoken to us and revealed who he is and what he's done. Theology in the broader sense is uh, God's word about other things. God has a lot of things to say about a lot of things such as man, that's anthropology, such as his son, Jesus Christ, that's Christology, and how he saves those who believe in him, that's soteriology. God's spoken many great words to us through them so that we might know him, love him, and obey him. So theology is important. Systematic theology considers the unity of God's word. God is true, and he does not lie. According to the writer of Hebrews, God's spoken in various, on various subjects in various ways at various times, and yet there are no contradictions in all that he has said. For example, God reveals in his word that he is sovereign. The scriptures also teach that man was created with a free will. The systematic theologian seeks to understand each of these individual doctrines and their relationship to one another within the context of the whole counsel of the one true God. Which brings us to the subject of free will. So when we talk about the will of man, first we've got to understand, well, what, what do we mean by will, and it, what does it mean to, for man to have a will? God's gifted each and every one of us a soul, and that soul has an intellect, intellect and a will. The intellect consists of comprehension, judgment, conscience. The intellect, not the will, judges in a given matter. It presents a matter to the will as being either discernible or contemptible, or desirable or contemptible, prescribing the course of action to be taken under the current circumstances. The faculty of judgment makes either a general determination about the validity of a matter and what sort of thing it is, or it applies itself to the will of man suggesting and determining what it is or not to be done. In other words, in other words, it's the judgment, the faculty of judgment, which is the determining factor. And that's based upon what we love or what we hate. The will then embraces this practical judgment and acts accordingly. If one judges erroneously, the will functions erroneously as well. At times, the intellect suggests something to the will which is enjoyable and advantageous, but not according to the truth. The will then embraces it as such, even though it is contrary to God's law. 
because that's the desires of the heart. Man, by the very fact of his creation and by virtue of his constitution, has endowed, has been endowed with a particular power, which is of the nature of a natural liberty to choose as he pleases or to exercise his voluntary activity as he desires. In this sense, and in this way, man is free. He freely chooses what his nature prefers. And he is responsible for the choices or volitions that he exercises. So man being created in the image of God is a dim reflection of his creator. God necessarily wills and acts according to the absolute perfection of his nature, yet with the highest liberty. The scriptures testify that God cannot lie. That's in Titus 1, 2. If God cannot lie, does that mean his will is not free? Absolutely not. He always wills and acts according to the perfection of his nature with full liberty. His will is not independent of his nature but one and the same. He does not lie because by nature he is true. We read that in John 3.33. Man in a like manner wills and acts according to his nature. Our nature, however, is not infinite, eternal, or unchangeable. Nevertheless, we still choose according to our nature, whether for good or for evil. So throughout history, there's been some different views on the will of man. I'm going to review a few of those as we move along here. Um, you can see this chart here. And in this chart, I'm, I'm listing four predominant views that, that you'll find in history. The Augustinian view, Pelagian, semi-Pelagian, and Arminian. And you can see there, there are names associated with them. Augustine of of Hippo, Pelagius, he was a British monk, John Cassian. He was kind of in between, an in between between Augustinian and Pelagian around the time of Augustine. And then you have uh, um, Ar James Arminius. Now, when you compare the views, you'll see there's, there's some similarities, but you, it's noticeable also the differences. Monergism means it's, uh, it's, it's a, uh, a work of one. And with, with Augustine, he held to a monergism of divine grace alone. It's the work of God when in comparing salvific work of the grace of God and the will of man. Pelagium, he believed that it was human will alone. Now, semi-Pelagian and Armenian are similar, but there's a, a little distinction between the two. Synergism is, is, means that it's a cooperative work. With semi-Pelagian, humans will assist divine grace. But with the Arminians, divine grace assists the human will. Let's uh, look at those a little closer. I'll talk about them as you, as you look at the chart. So with the Augustinian view, it asserts that man in this corrupt state has lost all ability to will any spiritual good accompanying salvation, and that natural man is not able by his own strength to convert himself or even prepare himself for it. Man's moral agency has been totally disabled so far as any ability to choose good or to will what is holy. The nature of man has been corrupted by sin, so his desires and dispositions are perverted, and his whole voluntary activity is turned away from God and holiness. Still, men freely choose to commit all their evil acts and are consequently responsible for them. Fallen man has liberty in the exercise of his will, but he does not have the ability to choose what is right or holy. He is perfectly free, even the exercise of evil acts. The disabling effects of sin which man has inherited and the guilt that rests upon him have entirely destroyed his ability to know, to love, to choose, or to will the good, but they have not destroyed his liberty or his ability in the love and choice of the evil. That's the Augustinian view. Now the Pelagian view 
maintains that men are capable of repentance and amendment and of arriving to the highest degrees of piety and virtue by use of their natural faculties and powers. It denies that sin has in any way disabled man's moral agency. Man has always possessed the power to will good or evil, to choose right or wrong. The first man had this power, and men ever since have retained the same ability. This view also denies that any evil result has come upon Adam's posterity by reason of its relationship to him. Men are brought into the world now with the same moral character that the first man had, and there is in it no bias to good or evil. Every man as a moral agent is free to choose in one way or the other on all moral questions. That's the Pelagian view. Now you'll see the semi-Pelagian view, it kind of straddles the two. The semi-Pelagian view allows a necessity of assisting grace to enable man to continue in our course of religious duties. However, they held that inward grace was not necessary to form the soul in the beginnings of true repentance and amendment. Every man was capable of pro producing these by the mere power of his natural faculties. This includes exercising faith in Christ and performing the purposes of a holy and sincere obedience. Now, the Arminian view is pretty similar to the Pelagian, but there's a few nuances. The Arminian view ascribes the conversion of the sinner to the grace of God, yet they ultimately resolve it into the free will of man. It denies that sin has entirely disabled the moral agency of man. It holds that it has been greatly weakened because of the sin of the first man, but the benefits of common grace bestowed upon all men as a result of the universal atonement for sin made by Christ restores all men to their moral ability. The moral weakness or disability which rests upon the race is a misfortune for which it is not responsible. Hence, Justice to the race on God's part required that he should in some way restore to man his moral ability. Otherwise, God could not justly punish men for remaining in their sinful estate. By reason of this, uh, by reason of this restored ability, men are able to choose or reject the good to accept or refuse the gospel. Now, I think the Bible teaches closer to the, well, teaches what the Augustinian view prescribes. And so we're going to look at, at the scriptures and then compare uh, a few things with that view. And you'll see uh, how that, as we go through this, how the other views aren't in accordance uh, with some of the scriptures I'm going to share with you. So I want to look at the, four, the fourfold state and will of man. It's a, there's a chart here for, on that one here. You can see here the fourfold state. Now when we talk about the fourfold state, it's talking about the state of man, first in his innocence. This would be Adam before he sinned. And Augustine put it like this, posse pecare, posse non pecare. It's Latin, meaning able to sin, able not to sin. So that was, that was the uh, state of um, Adam, his will, in the state of innocence. Now, after the fall, Adam and all who are in Adam are in a state of sin, non posse, non pecare, not able not to sin. So there's, they're the slaves of sin. That's all, of, that's all of mankind, with the exception of Jesus Christ. And then the state of grace, that, that's of those who are in Christ, who have been regenerated by the Spirit, given a new heart. Posse non pecare, able not to sin. And then the final state is the state of glory. After we die and are resurrected, we are resurrected into a state of non posse non pecare, not able to sin. 
Let's go through some of these. And look at it. Let's start with the will of man in the state of innocence. Man originally had a sinless personality. He desired only that which was good and well pleasing to God. He was free to do that which was according to his own desire. And because his nature was wholly uncorrupted, his desires were only good. You can see this in Genesis. Chapter 1, verses 27 and 31. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then we see, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. So we don't see any imperfection in the creation of man because we see the superlative there at the end on the sixth day that it was very good. In his unfallen state of innocence, the first view of man's moral agency appears. In this state, man had freedom of choice between good and evil, an ability both to will and to do that which was pleasing to God. This freedom and ability were not absolutely confirmed, though doubtless the desires and dispositions were toward the good. So man's moral agency in the state of innocence was a mutable ability to do all that God required of him. And being mutable, he was liable to fall from it. We, we can see this uh, when God gave him, put him in the garden, and he gave him this commandment. In Genesis 2, 16 and 17, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, from any tree of the garden you may free, eat freely, notice, freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. Man in his very nature, being endowed with volitional agency, is a free moral agent, and hence a responsible being. The Westminster Confession of Faith in chapter 9, verse 1 and 2 says this, God hath endued the will of man with that natural liberty that is neither forced nor by any absolute necessity of nature determined to good or evil. Man in his state of innocency had freedom and power to will and to do that which was good and well-pleasing to God, but yet mutable mutably so that he might fall from it. So in this state of innocence, the natural inclination of man's will was only to good, but it was liable to change through the power of temptation and therefore free to choose evil. In Ecclesiastes, we read this, truly this I have found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. So that's the first state of man, the state of innocence. Let's look at the next state. The will of man in the state of sin. And so in a sinful state, the moral agency of man has undergone important changes. Man has wholly lost all ability to will any spiritual good accompanying salvation. By the fall, he has lost all ability to will any spiritual good or to look to salvation. His dispositions have been corrupted and made adverse to that which is holy. He chooses what he pleases when he freely wills the evil. Yet, he has no ability in his natural state to choose in the opposite way. He is under spiritual death and has no power to will or do the spiritually good. He cannot, by any effort of his own, convert himself. Which means he can't change his natural dispositions. And consequently, he's unable to restore himself to himself the ability to prefer and choose good. Nor can he prepare himself to do so. And the reason is, we see in, in Ephesians chapter 2, and you were dead 
in your sins and trespasses, or trespasses and sins. That's uh, Ephesians 2 1. So just as a corpse has arms and legs, which lie unused because the one who exercised them is dead, so it is with the will of man. He's spiritually dead. With sin's entrance, man lost ability to do good, not the liberty. This was due to the fact that one sin, as God had warned, was sufficient to destroy the pure nature from which alone the good fruit of right action could issue. Before the fall, man was at liberty to do either good or evil. He was able to do either, but after the fall, he remained free to do either good or evil, but he was only able to do evil. We read in Genesis 6, 5, every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And therefore, that makes him a slave of sin. And we read this in Romans 6, 20. For when you were, the, were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So no man is able to come to Christ, is what... Jesus tells us in John 6, 44, but this is due to his own nature. He is not kept from any good by external force or coercion. He's kept from it by the very laws of his own depraved character. This is what the Westminster Confession of Faith says in section three of chapter nine. Man by his fall into a state of sin hath wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man being altogether adverse from that good and dead in sin is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. What a sinful man needs is not merely a restoration of ability in regard to the choice of good, but rather a radical change in the desires and dispositions of his nature. For it is out of these dispositions that choice, volition, or self-determination freely flows. Till this change is effected, the man with the sinful disposition always prefers the sinful and wills or choose that accordingly. This is what Paul writes in Romans. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. In his corrupt, natural corrupt state, man freely chooses evil without any compulsion or constraint on his will. He cannot do otherwise, being under the bondage of sin. Paul says this to the Corinthians. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And being dead, he doesn't have that discernment. Only the desire for the evil. Which brings us to grace the will of man in the state of grace. In the state of grace, man's freed from his natural bondage and sin is delivered from his inability to will, which is spiritually good. This is brought about by the effectual grace of God, which works a radical renovation in the sinful, helpless state of man's moral nature and by means which he is translated into a state of grace. In favor. Ezekiel held out this promise, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. That's Ezekiel 36, 24. In this gracious spiritual condition, he is delivered from the bondage of his moral and spiritual inability. 
And the consequence of this is that the sinner is endowed with the ability to freely will and do that which is spiritually good. He is made willing in the day of God's gracious power, which delivers him from the thraldom in which sin holds him and makes him free in Christ Jesus. Jesus said this in John 8. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. By reason of his remaining corruption, man does not perfectly nor only will that which is good, but he does also will that which is evil. This may be, so he's kind of in a mixed state, wherein the will freely chooses good or evil, having the power to do so, though not in the sense of having the power of contrary choice. The remaining corruption, which is slowly rooted out from the nature of the believer, sometimes leads him into sin. So we still struggle with the presence of sin but not the power, but the bondage is because the bondage of sin is broken and ability to will and do the good is enjoyed, though holiness is not yet confirmed. The confession puts it this way. When God converts a sinner and translates him into the state of grace, he freeth him from his natural bondage under sin and by his grace alone enables him freely to will and to do that which is spiritually good. Yet so, that by reason of his remaining corruption, he doth not perfectly nor only will that which is good, but doth also will that which is evil. The difference between an unregenerate man and a regenerate man is one of ability, not liberty. Both are free to do good, but only the regenerate man is able to do good. He is able because God the Holy Spirit has given him a new heart, as we read. He is made a new creature. Therefore, he has ability to will and to do what is good. Yet the regenerate man's ability is not identical with that which Adam originally had. Adam was once able to do God's will perfectly. The regenerate man is not yet able to do God's will perfectly. This does not mean that he's not a new creature. Indeed, he is. He does truly delight in the will of God. He does persist in the way of righteousness. That's in 1 John 3, 9. Sin cannot prevail in him as it formerly did, but sin is present with him, Romans 7, 21. The reason for this is that those who are new creatures in Christ are in the process of being made holy. That's called sanctification. They are not finished products, even though they are being wholly changed. Which brings us to the final state, state of glory. In the state of glory, the will of man is made perfectly and immutably free to good alone. There is now confirmation in holiness. The corruption of the nature has been entirely removed. Certainty of holy volitions is fully and forever assured, and the saints in glory enjoy a freedom and enlarged liberty such as they cannot know in this life. John writes about in his first epistle, Beloved, now... We are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's 1 John 3, 2. So in the state of glory, the blessed freely choose what is good. And being confirmed in a state of perfect holiness, they can only will what is good. This is how the confession puts it. The will of man is made perfectly and immutably free to do good alone in the state of glory only. In glory, God's work in the regenerate will be done. 
But even then, man will possess essentially the same liberty that he ha now has. The difference will be in the measure of his ability, not liberty, to do good. He will then be able to do only that which is right. This will be because his nature will then be confirmed in holiness and wholly contrary to all evil. He will no longer be susceptible to sin's attraction. He will not even possess the slightest desire to do anything evil anymore. Now that's a great hope. There will no longer be any struggle with sin. Our only desires will be to please and to glorify God through Jesus Christ. This is how Jude ends his epistle. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Notice that we will be faultless in his presence with exceeding joy. That's the hope of every Christian, and that is what, what is to come. We now struggle with sin, and it will continue in this life. The battle will rage until that day. But the power of sin has been defeated in Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And by faith, we are in him and we are changed. So let us pray and be thankful for the grace which God has given us in Christ. We do thank you, Father, for all that you've done, how you've taken our sinful hearts and given us new hearts not by anything that we have done or anything in us, but only by your mere grace and grace alone in Christ. We're so grateful and we pray, Lord, that as we continue on in your word, and by your spirit, that you would sanctify us and prepare us for that day wherein we long to be in the presence of Christ and be like him. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.